Well, this morning, uh, as we gather here in the body of Christ uh, to worship together, to uphold one another, and to, to be friendly, um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And this morning, I'm, I'm speaking about uh, being clothed with power. And I've used uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 1 through 21 as uh, the basis for this message this morning. You know, there's no better proof uh, that Jesus was who he said he was uh, than the before and after pictures of uh, the, the disciples at Pentecost. You know, if you think about it, before Pentecost, these disciples were, it almost seems like they were a little bit dense, uh, timid, bumblers, uh, who seemed to, to, to run at the first sign of, of trouble. But afterwards, that's what we need to see. Afterwards, uh, they were a bunch of fearless leaders. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. Uh, they went to jail gladly. Uh, I went to jail once, but I wasn't happy about it. <laughs> they sang hymns, and uh, uh, they sang until the, the, till the walls fell down. How did all this happen? Well, you can read about it in, in, in the whole book of Acts. Uh, the last thing that Jesus told his disciples to do before he ascended unto heaven was to go back to Jerusalem and wait for God's promise to come. They would be baptized by the Holy Spirit, he told them, and they would be clothed with power from on high. You can find that again in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. With little or no idea of what any of that meant, they did what they were told. They went back to Jerusalem, not to the temple, by the way, but to an ordinary room in an ordinary place. And there they waited, along with the women who had come along with them, uh, including, by the way, Jesus' mother and, and his brothers. For the most part, uh, they prayed while they waited. And I expect some of them were, were asking God to, to th tell them a little bit about what they were waiting for. How would they know when the power had, had fallen on them? Uh, would it tingle? Uh, would it hurt? Uh, and how did the Holy Spirit go about baptizing people anyway? Jesus had something to say about fire. Did he mean real fire or spiritual fire? Maybe uh, they should fill some jars with water just in case. Yeah. You never know when things can get out of hand. Well, they didn't have to wait long for their answers. On the day of Pentecost, uh, a Jewish festival that was set to... Uh, for 50 days after Passover, they were all together in one place when the power arrived. First, according to scripture, there was wind, then there was fire, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in strange languages. One spoke uh, Parthian, uh, another spoke Latin, others Egyptian and Arabic. Now, I'm betting a dollar to a donut. They didn't have a clue what they were saying. Not a clue. But the crowd knew. The crowd knew. Devout Jews from all over the world stood in the doorways and the windows uh, listening to a bunch of Galileans uh, Tell about the power of God in, in their in their own language language that uh, so that no one that had come to Jerusalem was left out. Everyone heard. 
the Holy Spirit turned out to be a, a, a phenomenal uh, linguist uh, whom everybody present could understand. But it still baffled them. Baffled the speakers as well as the listeners. They were in the midst of something that was uh, beyond reason. And some of them just couldn't bear it. So they, they began coming up with their own uh, reason. Someone said, hmm, it's that new wine. It's that new wine they've been drinking. They're drunk. But Peter stood up and he said, no, that's not true. Hey, you guys, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. We haven't had time to get drunk yet. I suppose if it had been later on in the day, he might have had a uh, uh, little trouble with explaining that. But uh. And then he got up and delivered a, a, a sensational sermon uh, based on the second chapter of Joel, where uh, we read it earlier. Uh, in the last days, he proclaimed, quoting Joel, who was quoting God, uh, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see uh, visions and your old men shall dream dreams. That's what's happening now, Peter tells them. The Holy Spirit of God is being poured out on them and, and this is how it looks. Wind like the wind that revived the valley of dry bones, a fire like the fire that... Uh, uh, led Israel through the desert in tongues like the tongues that, that erupted at Babel, but this time it's only in reverse. At that time, God confused them all. At this, this time now, he's enlightening them all. What sounds like Babel is intelligible speech and everyone present is understanding it. According to the book of Acts, there was 3,000 people that were, that were baptized that day. It was nothing short of a miracle. It was the birthday of the Christian church uh, when a, a dozen bumbling disciples received power from on high and proceeded to turn the world upside down. What happened in that room spread from from Jerusalem to, to Athens, to Rome, to Alexandria. Uh, it spread across nations, across centuries, across cultures, uh, uh, far removed from Israel as, as far as we are from the moon. Because of what happened in that room, people who don't speak a word of Hebrew have come to believe in a Hebrew Lord who is worshiped today in every language on earth. But it all happened by the power of the Holy Spirit, which the Bible talks about in at least two ways. First, as the abiding presence of God in Christ, with all the safety and comfort that a relationship promises, this is the spirit that most of us know and love, the spirit of peace, the one that, that soothes our, our, our ruffled feathers and revives our, our weary souls, uh, the one that is with us always, even to the end of the age. And whenever we have the, the good sense to breathe, we say, hey, thank you, Lord. But there's another way uh, the spirit acts. Not another spirit, but a, another manifestation of the same spirit. This side is not nearly as comforting. This is the, the spirit who, who, who blows and burns and howling down the chimney, turning all, all lawn furniture upside down. Uh, Ask Job about the whirlwind. 
or Ezekiel about the chariot of fire. Ask anyone who was in that room in Pentecost what it was like to be caught up in that spirit and, and whether it's something they would like to, to happen every Sunday afternoon. When I was uh, associate pastor at uh, Church of God in Durand, uh, they were kind of a wild bunch. literally uh, but uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, usually those services they start at 11 and end about two you know that kind of uh, that kind of thing uh, that particular day I'm thinking about had a great choir About a four or five piece band uh, sound system that was turned up on on kaboom uh, and things happened uh, the collection and the music and uh, all the announcing and that sort of thing but for Two, three hours, we sang, we clapped our hands, uh, raised our hands in the air. Children stood stomping their feet on the, uh, uh, on the pews, and some of them crawled underneath the pews. And uh, I don't think any adults did, but maybe they did. But, Mothers praise God with their children in their arms and they, they danced around in their place. And in uh, the music just kept going and going, almost like a crescendo. And, uh, and the people were filled with, with, with the, the Spirit of God. Uh, there was an old man in the church. Well, I don't know if he's as old as Joe. Uh, old man uh, and uh, the spirit of the Lord touched that old geezer he jumped out of his pew and he ran around the perimeter of the of the pews and uh, there was a a young man who was mentally challenged he uh, he saw that old man get up and run, and he thought, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. So he got up, and he went the other way. Uh, and when they got back to the altar, that young man crashed right into that old geezer, knocked him cold turkey right out. I don't remember if we had to call the ambulance or not. I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, it's kind of hard to sit still when that stuff is going on. Most people, when they're in that kind of situation, they will try to make themselves very small. <laughs> Slide down in the pew so no one sees them. So was it, was all of this a, a reaction of, of people's emotions? Or was there something going on, the Spirit of the Lord? Uh, I think the latter. Uh, most of you know that uh, I made 25 trips to Africa. And uh, I'm telling you, we could learn a lot 
from those poor people in Africa because they're not really poor. Maybe in, in, in dollars, but not in spirit. And uh, you go into a church setting and uh, I was in one for 13 hours. 13 hours dancing and singing and, and clapping and reading God's word. And, uh, they know how to worship the Lord. Because they're they're not they're not tied down to to things like we are. They're not afraid what their neighbor is going to say about them. They're just not. So if I've been in that same room on that same day in Pentecost. What would I have done? I'd like to think that I would do whatever everyone else was doing. Just becoming free and worshiping the Lord. Or would we say, Lord, if you're going to pour out your spirit, uh, there's others in the pew Pass it on down to them and just, just please skip me. So am I the only one? Are, 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 are we uh, running around with an umbrella when it looks like the spirit is about to uh, rain down uh, uh, wind with fire? Someone said only a fool, only a fool would pray for the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you, only fools for Christ do. That's all. I believe the Spirit is most present in three open spaces in our lives. In the unpredictable, in the place of risk, and over those areas that we have absolutely no control over. See, that's where the disciples were. And that's where we are more times than we want to admit. Not only as individuals, but also uh, as members of this body that uh, that was born some over two thousand years ago. It's not a crime to pray for the gentle spirit at such time. It's not a crime to ask God to restore predictability, uh, to remove us from risk, and to give back. To to us, the, the, the comfortable illusion of control that helps us sleep at night. But I want to tell you this morning, and I'm winding down here. I want to tell you that the Pentecost is a reminder that there's another kind, another side of God's spirit. One that can set us on fire to transform our lives, to, to, to turn the world upside down. That is not predictable. It's very risky, and it's beyond our control. But one thing we can do is, is fold up our umbrellas and put them away and then and come to the table. If we want to be fools for Christ, And I do, I do. I want to be clothed with power from on high.
power from on high that doesn't bind us or hinder us, but sets us free so we can be free indeed. Let's pray. Dear Father, some of us know, oh God, how many strange things have happened uh, around this year table over the years and around other tables just like this in other churches. People have seen God, have seen Christ, and have decided to follow him. Lives that were selfish and broken and full of fear have been turned around and given to God. Whole congregations, the Lord, have suddenly come, come together and uh, in unity of spirit and dedicated to doing your will and changing the world for you. Let that be the kind of outpouring of your Holy Spirit of power for us in this church for these times and for these days as we gather around your table this morning. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>